Hello everybody, David Shapiro here with another video. Today's video by uh, also popular demand as many are lately is how do we pay for UBI? So I have made a few videos about post labor economics and you know forever jobs and that sort of stuff. I am pretty convinced that most jobs as we know them are gonna go away. Now that's not to say that there's that there aren't things that you can do for uh, money in the future, you know, post singularity, post AGI, whatever. But, you know, people are very critical, and, and rightfully so, there are problems with UBI. So let's unpack some of those problems, but then let's also look at how we can actually make it financially feasible. Before we jump in, I want to do a quick plug for my Patreon. Uh, I give away all of my videos for free, no ads. I also have uh, hundreds of GitHub repos. I give all my code away for free. Uh, because I want to help build the future, and I believe that lowering friction uh, by giving information, valuable information away for free is the best way to do that. With that being said, I have turned down a lot of job offers and contract offers, and I refuse to sign NDAs, but that means that my support needs to come from you people. Uh, so if you want to incentivize the behavior you want to see, <laughs> sharing uh, valuable information, please consider jumping over and supporting me on Patreon. Uh, all tiers get you access to the exclusive Discord, uh, so it's it's not something for nothing. Uh, so yeah, thanks for uh, all the support from my existing Patreons. And with that, let's get back to the show. Uh, so right now, uh, quick other tangent, uh, Gato update. So I am very excited and pleased to announce that the Gato community has not one but two submissions to the OpenAI Democratic Inputs to AI Grant Challenge. So this is really incredible. Uh, leaders have emerged in the community and have definitely stepped up. So remember, step up is one of our traditions. Uh, and the decentralized aspect of Gato is taking over. Basically, you don't need my permission to do anything, but the community that, that I have built, that we have built, is there to support everyone in whatever initiative makes most sense for them to help achieve uh, global consensus and alignment and to solve the control problem and ultimately create utopia. That is the, that is the final, the, the, I don't know about final goal, but that's the big goal. That's the mission. Uh, now, we are also have our first hackathon coming up. And so this is going to be layer one of Gato, reinforcement learning with heuristic imperatives. Uh, I've been having meetings with people. I've been talking with folks. Uh, it's slowly coming together. I've never put on a hackathon before, uh, so I'm talking to people. The best, if you're interested in participating or want to share any insight, the best place to connect with me is either on LinkedIn or join the Gato community. The link is here, um, gatoframework.org slash join Gato. You can also find the link in the description. We need sponsors, organizers, judges, partners, mentors. That's going to be a big one. Team leaders. Um, so this is coming together. We're hoping to launch it sometime in July. Uh, but again, this is my first rodeo. So I'm trying to learn everything I can up front. All right, now let's get back to UBI. How do we pay for it? I used to think that this was just kind of a thought stopping platitude. Uh, but when I looked into it, I, I, I really tried hard to figure out, okay, how, do, how can we pay for it with conventional means? And the answer is not quite what I expected. And maybe it's not what you expected. All right, so here's the problem. Uh, as uh, you can easily do some math, in a previous video where I talked about life under UBI, I said, let's figure out how you can actually live with $2,000 a month. People, I think, accept the premise of like, if you can get to $2,000 a month just for existing, great, we can make that work. Some people are unhappy with some of the ideas, but you know what? It's not perfect. And also, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you how it's going to work out exactly. That being said... $2,000 a month in America with 330 million Americans is somewhere between $7 trillion and $8 trillion per year to fund a UBI. So how do you do this? Do you tax and redistribute? Uh, taxes would have to be insanely high to support this, uh, and not to mention the inflation, inflationary problem. But I'm not as worried about inflation because if UBI becomes necessary, the job loss is going to be super deflationary. And as lots of people point out, uh, if consumers have no money to spend, then you know the economy basically stalls. So basically, UBI might be necessary in order to just keep the economy going. But that being said, it's not as simple as just tax and redistribute. I thought that it would be. 
so there's a concept called velocity of currency, uh, which is basically how often does a dollar change hands. And the velocity of currency, I think, would have to be three times higher than what it is now, just in order to have enough transactions uh, to, to, to even tax to get to that $2,000 a month. Um, so you, you could either do that or you could tax mo levy more taxes on static money, like any bank account over $10,000 or whatever. Uh, but this is getting really, really draconian really quickly you'd have to force enforce a lot more circulation. Um, and so then I was like, okay, I keep going down this rabbit hole and it's just not working. It doesn't make sense. Um, so I was like, maybe we're putting the cart before the horse. Maybe, maybe we need to look at something else before we look at UBI to make UBI sustainable and feasible. And so then I was like, okay, well, money is, is an abstraction of value. It's a, it's a reserve of value and it's a medium of exchange. But let's look at the underpinning assets. What is the actual value in goods and services that money is meant to buy for you? Uh, so that's where I went next. But before we get into that, I want to kind of give a little bit of context about the economic pillars and how I kind of came to this conclusion that just raw redistribution in our current economic uh, paradigm isn't going to work. So basically, there are four pillars of the economy. You've got banks, namely central banks and regional banks and federal banks. Then you have the government, you know, particularly the federal government. You have businesses and corporations, and then you have consumers. So these are the primary estates or pillars of the economy. And so consumers is the aggregate, you know, all individuals and households that need goods and services and generally also sometimes provide work. Usually the way that they get income is in exchange for labor. Sometimes there's also entitlements or, uh, or capital that they own. So those are the three primary ways that consumers get money, right? An entitlement might come from the government, such as your, your, your pension or your, uh, your, your social security check. Uh, that sort of thing. So you get money that way. Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, the, the government health, uh, you know, through the VA, that gives you buying power, which means that you can then go to a business uh, such as a healthcare provider or a grocery store or whatever um, to demand goods and services such as healthcare, food. Uh, education is an entitlement. So that is something that you don't even pay for. The government just pays for it directly via taxes. Uh, and then, but then one thing that a lot of people don't know is where does the money come from? Well, what you need to understand about the monetary system is that the money comes from central banks, comes from the federal bank, which uh, creates money by lending it. But the thing is, is that that money then has to be repaid. And so that's whenever you hear in the news, like the Fed is changing the interest rate, that's what it, that's what they're doing is they're changing the fundamental interest rate. And when that money is repaid to the central banks, it's actually just taken off the market entirely. With that being said, the total supply of money goes up over time. It, like def there is, there is an optimal amount of inflation that, uh, that they go for. Cause the idea is that if the value of your dollar goes down over time, then you are incentivized to to spend it sooner rather than later, which keeps the economy churning. Because under deflationary pressures, you might as well hold on to your money because holding on to cash is an investment. If your dollar will go twice as far a year from now as it does today, you're not gonna spend any money, you're gonna wait. So having an optimal amount of inflation is what the central banks do to ensure that you are going to spend that money on labor and other investments to keep the economy humming along. So with that being said, you can't just inject a lot of money. Like, you know, the idea of like, what if you do quantitative easing, which is just creating billions or trillions of dollars and give it to consumers? That's called hyperinflation and that is super bad. And I think I'm actually supposed to be, oh yeah, sorry. So uh, if, uh, sorry, I meant to move on to a slide. So if you do just quantitative easing, just injecting money into the system, that's hyperinflation, which means that you severely depress the value of money, which means that like, okay, the money that you have today is going to be worth a lot less tomorrow. And so uh, inflation can be caused by two primary things, supply and demand. So supply is what we're experiencing uh, post pandemic because of logistic and supply chain issues. Because of supply chain issues, uh, the supply of goods is lower, which means the prices go up. 
Alternatively, if the demand goes up, the prices can also go up. And that's what we saw a little bit. The effect wasn't uh, too pronounced, but it was pronounced enough to be meaningful with the stimulus checks that Americans got during the pandemic, which caused some inflation. It didn't cause most of the inflation that we're seeing. Most of the inflation that we're seeing is due to uh, geopolitics and globalism and global trade, uh, you know, namely like the war in Russia and, and Ukraine right now. That is a far larger impact on inflation than uh, the stimulus checks. That being said, if we were to do stimulus checks for everyone every month, we would absolutely see hyperinflation, which is really bad because all you're doing is injecting money um, into the consumer part. And then, okay, that money goes where? It goes to businesses, and so then the businesses have more aggregate demand. But then how do you take that money back off of the table so that you, uh, you, you, you basically fight it with deflation? You'd have to have someone just hoovering up that extra money and destroying it. So does that mean the government just then taxes everyone to, to take that quantitative easing back off of the uh, economy? We might get there. Uh, especially once we get to a period of hyperabundance and where like nobody works and labor, like human labor is completely uh, worthless. But I don't, th I don't see that we're there yet. And I, and I think that such a, a fundamental paradigm shift in economics probably shouldn't be done all at once. We should probably work towards that slowly because again, the economic system is huge, cumbersome. There's a tremendous amount of inertia. And so I was like, okay, clearly like thinking about it in terms of current velocity of currency and circulation and cycles, uh, like a hydrological cycle. It, that's how it works now, but we can't fundamentally change this. We can't upend it uh, very quickly. So I was like, all right, this direction of thinking isn't working. So let's look at first principles. So supply and demand. So what I mean is if you can get a hyperabundance of supply, right, post-scarcity, then the price goes down. And so then I was like, okay, well, if we really, really drastically increase supply of basic goods, basic services, then maybe we can get the prices low enough that UBI is actually really cheap overall. And so what I mean by that is, what if we can get your cost of living from $4,000 a month to $400 a month as it is today through hyperabundance, through post-scarcity, and we can get there through things like uh, AI, solar, quantum computing, and that sort of thing. So let's unpack this a little bit further and figure out how we can make that happen. Let's take a look at the at consumer expenses. So this is as of 2016, so it's a little bit out of date, but in general, this pie chart doesn't change. We generally spend about a third of our money on housing, another 16% on transportation, almost 13% on food, 12% on insurance and uh, paying into pensions, uh, or retirement plans, 8% on healthcare, so on and so forth, and then down to 2.5% on education. Obviously, the education number is much larger for some people. Uh, I've, I've known people that, that spent more on their, uh, their college loans than their home loans, which is just completely insane to me. But we, took, we take a look at these top five categories, right? One, two, three, four, five. And if we can use the hyperabundance of solar and fusion and whatever else, uh, wind energy, and then we can also use the hyperabundance of cognitive labor from AI, we could probably reduce costs of a lot of these sectors. Now, these sectors are very, very different, but I did find some commonalities that I think we can focus on. So first is transportation. Obviously, Elon Musk and Tesla and full self-driving cars and all the EVs coming onto the road, this is going to have an economic effect. But it, one thing is that transportation is central to the economy because you need transportation to move goods, services, and people, um, or to move goods and people, uh, and then you can provide services such as ride shares, delivery, that sort of thing. So right now, internal combustion engine cars cost about 75 cents per rider mile. This varies a lot depending on the car you have and where you are. Because uh, obviously if you're driving, you know, an F-350 dually, that costs a little bit more to drive per mile than, you know, a Toyota Prius. But on average, internal combustion engine cars cost about 70 cents per rider mile. Now, what's interesting is that in America, because of regulatory problems and technical issues and supply chain issues, 
EVs are often more expensive per rider mile. The total cost of ownership of EVs is actually still higher than internal combustion engines. Now, that being said, EV ride sharing, such as if you don't own the car, but instead you just, you know, use Uber or Lyft or Waze or whatever, and then, you know, a couple minutes later, an autonomous car comes to pick you up, the, 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 the cost of that rider mile could be as low as six cents per rider mile. So we're seeing, we see the possibility of like a 12x reduction or more of the cost of transportation uh, if we can figure out full self-driving and fully autonomous uh, EV uh, vehicles. And some of this will be fixed by economies of scale. But that being said, uh, the if you can reduce the cost of transportation by a factor of 10 or more, this is going to have knock-on effects uh, across the rest of the economy. And so we'll unpack this effect uh, throughout the rest of the video. So here's some of the knock-on effects that we might see. Just I want to prime your, prime your, your mind to think about the knock-on effects. Oh, and also just imagine the knock-on effects of reducing the cost of energy by 10x with solar, with fusion. And of course, with fusion, the cost of energy goes down 1,000x. It goes down 10,000x to the point that it is a trivial cost. So the idea is that, uh, well, first, think all goods that you need, right? Every cloth Every piece of clothing, all the food you eat, all the materials that go into your house, literally every physical good has to be transported at least a short distance. Uh, many of them have to be transported across the entire planet. So if we can get the cost of transportation to a fraction of what it is today, that will lower the cost of living drastically. Because uh, then, you know, the supply chain is faster, more efficient, cheaper. Uh, we can also use artificial intelligence to shorten those supply chains. Quantum computing can probably help with logistics as well. Energy hyperabundance will also help with that because that means that you can have fully automated factories in the next city over and your stuff doesn't have to come from across the planet. You can have vertical farms and container farms, meaning that all of your food and exotic fruit and everything is grown right next door year round with the energy abundance of solar and wind and that sort of stuff. Uh, economies of scale, artificial intelligence, uh, can help us find alternative battery technology. So for instance, um, there's, what is it, the iron oxygen batteries that are being worked on and, and other stuff that doesn't use risky uh, minerals. Now, I know that lithium is hypothetically super abundant, but you know, looking at the elemental composition of the crust of the earth is one thing. Looking at the mining infrastructure and the concentration uh, that makes it economically feasible to extract is an entirely other argument. Um, but anyways, moving stuff around the planet is very expensive and it is a very complicated thing. So the combination of uh, transport revolution along with energy hyperabundance is going to really drastically drop that. So this is going to have knock-on effects that's going to lower the cost of everything, like just full stop, it's going to lower the cost of everything across the planet. Housing. So the biggest... Uh, uh, expense that we all have is housing. So let's assume that, okay, moving timber, harvesting wood, uh, making concrete, all of these things that are very, very uh, material intensive, you have to move a lot of heavy materials, and they're also very energy intensive. Carbon, uh, sorry, concrete accounts just on its own, concrete accounts for I think more than 8% of global carbon emissions. So like this is a very energy intensive and very material intensive thing, which is why houses are so expensive. There's also the labor aspect. It takes a lot of labor and expertise to build a house. So what if we can really drastically uh, reduce the cost of building homes, whether it's a single family home or a duplex or a small apartment or row houses, whatever. Uh, there's a few ways that we can approach this. But again, remember, transportation has already lowered the cost a lot. Uh, things like 3D printed houses. I watched an entire documentary to do research and 3D printed houses are more durable. Um, so they're also cheaper. Their upfront cost is much cheaper because it takes a lot less labor to build them. Uh, so you, you with, with robotic automation, you get as many humans out of it as possible, which makes it faster and cheaper. The end product is better too. So better, cheaper, faster. This is what AI and automation does. 
better, cheaper, faster. You combine the existing innovation of 3D printing with energy hyperabundance, and then you add even more AI and automation. Uh, and then suddenly you can just 3D print houses a thousand a day if you need to. Uh, now, one problem is that this requires regulatory overhaul. Uh, this is a very new discipline, and so a lot of manufacturers aren't even touching this thing. Uh, with that being said, I suspect we're going to see a ramp up because um, some of the big housing uh, manufacturers, the ones that make uh, gigantic subdivisions like Lamar, they're already experimenting with this and investing in it. Um, and so when the investment is there, you know that it's coming fast. And I was actually surprised to learn that there are entire subdivisions across America that have already been 3D printed. And I really wish that they were here in the South because I super want a 3D printed house. Can you imagine having a castle made of concrete that is 3D printed and extruded? I super want that super bad. But I don't think that there's anyone doing it here in the South. We'll see. So... How much is this going to actually reduce the cost of homes? I found evidence that some small 3D printed homes could be as low as $4,000. Um, generally, they're closer to $10,000 uh, for a small one. And of course, one thing that a lot of people complained about when I mentioned like moving into tiny houses and you know portable houses and stuff like that is people are like, I don't want to live in a closet. Like, it's not a closet. It's just a small house. Anyways. Icon is a company that exists today and is printing 2,000 square foot houses for $100,000. So my house that I live in now is 1,800 square feet on an acre of land and I paid $200,000 for it 10 years ago. So I could have something a little bit bigger for half that price. And of course, my house is worth like $400,000 now because uh, of you know inflation and stuff. So these, these commercial uh, buildings are much cheaper already. So if they're, you know, twice as cheap or, ha or uh, sorry, half as cheap or, or a fifth as, as expensive as it costs to build uh, stick-built homes, then we're already on the way to that, like, let's, let's collapse the price of housing. Now, you combine uh, solar, AI, uh, wind, uh, eventually fusion, Concrete gets much cheaper. Uh, you can you, you can also factory farm wood more. You can automate uh, uh, timber forests. Um, and so then let's let's say that we're we're working towards dropping the the uh, cost of housing by at least ten x. So instead of thirty three percent or thirty five percent of your daily or your monthly income, it costs three and a half percent. So my twelve hundred dollar mortgage would go down to one hundred and twenty dollars which is pretty sustainable. That's just a couple days worth of work for, for many people, uh, and it's less than an hour of work for a lot of uh, professionals. That being said, we're looking at you know UBI, which is nobody works. But if you can mass produce homes, then like, hey, great. Now also with UBI, because one thing that people have pointed out is that uh, land is expensive. Desirable land will always be expensive, but America is really really empty. Sorry, I have that in a future slide. There is lots and lots of land to expand into. So land is actually going to be relatively cheap. Uh, the hardest part is going to be water, but we can fix that with solar because then you can distill and recycle any amount of water. In the long run, I think that I think the compounding returns of robotic automation, artificial intelligence, and energy hyperabundance means that we could eventually see a 100x drop in the cost of housing meaning that a $500,000 house in today's money would cost you $5,000 in 10 to 20 years. Now, food and other goods. So what I realized is that, okay, transportation, great, you solved that problem. You've basically solved a lot of other problems that have, again, those knock-on effects. You fix transportation, you make it super cheap, that makes housing cheaper, uh, you get compounding returns there because all the lessons that you learn from robotic automation for delivery and, and that sort of stuff, that makes, th that makes that cheaper. But those lessons also apply directly to agriculture as well as a bunch of other things. Now, one thing that I thought was that, okay, if these industries get so cheap that they're not sustainable, because what happens is the margins narrow. And so when you have no profit that can be made, you have to either become a nonprofit organization and, and uh, you know, basically survive on uh, subsidies uh, or donations, 
or you can be nationalized by the by the by the government, uh, which means that the government then runs things. But uh, the Soviets tried to nationalize agriculture, and it caused mass famines that killed like millions and millions and millions of people. Um, so we should not. We should probably never nationalize agriculture, at least not for a long time until it is so thoroughly operationalized that there is no chance for accidentally causing mass famine through central management. So I am personally in the favor of keeping private corporations, but then subsidizing their existence, which we already do, by, by the way. We subsidize corn and a few other uh, mass crops just so that that way we can ensure that it keeps growing. So we're already doing that. So if we also subsidize other things like home building so that no matter how cheap it actually gets, the corporations can keep building them, um, and then the government gives them just a little bit of money to ensure that they remain afloat. Uh, another possibility is changing ownership models, which I talked about in other videos. So by, by creating locally owned decentralized autonomous organizations, you could probably incorporate uh, the land, you know, the, the, the uh, municipally owned land, and then it can be owned, operated, and managed by the citizens of that city or county. So that is an ownership model that also makes sense because then there's no profit motive. It's basically, we're going to work this land to feed our local community, and if we do have any excess, we can then sell it to neighboring communities or whatever. Local sourcing, circular economies, that sort of stuff. AI, energy hyperabundance, and robotic automation will all make this a lot more feasible. And in fact, again, if those prices collapse, it'll be necessary to do that because then you're providing a good or a service not for profit, but just because it's needed. Um, so, you know, the best the best good is the one that's basically free or uh, kind of woven into the fabric of your community. Automated forestry, as I mentioned, timber is one of the most useful resources out there. First, uh, uh, creating uh, felling trees and creating lumber from it is a carbon sink. Uh, actually building homes out of wood permanently sequesters or semi-permanently sequesters that into uh, into um into uh, the, the structure of the house. Concrete, even though it's very energy intensive to create now, uh, is also going to be a carbon sink or a potential carbon sink, depending on the additives that you add to it. And so then you have a permanent carbon sink. So automating forestry, automating uh, the, the production of concrete, these things can be probably used to, one, help fight climate change, because it's like, okay, there's a X amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Let's pull that carbon out, put it into, into trees, and then we can use that to uh, then build homes. Uh, and so my idea here is you co-locate automated forests with uh, a modular home factory, and then you deliver those modular uh, house components with fully automated self-driving semi-trucks, and then the final assembly and site prep is done with robots. And so you have this end-to-end a uh, new supply chain that is 100% sustainable. Uh, there's just a few things that we need there. Uh, energy abundance, uh, better robots, a little bit better AI, and full self-driving cars. But the economic incentive is there for all of that to happen. So this, these, these virtuous cycles, these compounding returns, I think will allow us to drastically drop the prices of our most expensive uh, asset, which is our homes. All right, so... Let's do a quick price check. If uh, Just for ballpark figures, for something that's kind of more reasonable in the short term, let's imagine that within five to 10 years we can, uh, and it probably will take longer than that, honestly, just because of uh, inertia, uh, but we drop our housing costs by 10x, we drop our food costs by 10x, and we drop our transportation by 10x. Uh, so basically, your, your basic living expenses for me, go from $2,150 a month to $250 a month. Your dollar can go a lot farther with technology. So that leaves healthcare, insurance, and a few other uh, big expenses like clothing and you know uh, fun and entertainment and that sort of stuff. But healthcare is one of the biggest ones that's remaining. Education is also expensive, but I, I actually didn't even feel like I needed to address education, especially for the younger people who are all already using ChatGPT to learn everything. Um, and that's only going to get better, by the way. Uh, you're going to have AI and robotic tutors and teachers and stuff that are going to be uh, infinitely patient, fully personalized. So I actually had a really good conversation with someone who wants to deploy AI to Africa, 
um, to basically say, we're going to take Africa uh, as an entire continent straight into the 21st century by providing personalized education for literally every child in Africa. So I'm really excited to be helping out with that project. Uh, but the idea is that AI can do that. So, and it's also going to be cheap. So I, that's why I didn't, I, I guess I did just address uh, education. But anyways, let's break down healthcare. Because healthcare is like the gigantic elephant in the room, particularly here in America. But it's also a contentious issue in uh, places with uh, socialized medicine, uh, such as Britain and France. There's long waiting lists. Um, and then, of course, the their private uh, uh, care is available. Um, but like, I, what was I reading? Like, Dental care in Britain is actually kind of difficult because dentists are required to take a certain number of, you know, like they have a quota of, uh, of you know, government provided ones, but they will prefer to do, uh, you know, to do uh, private uh, funded, like right off the bat. So like if you're on a waiting list, if you have money and pay for it out of pocket, you can get care immediately. So there are problems with the idea of socialized medicine. So the idea is let's drive down the cost of socialized medicine as much as possible uh, to, to basically uh, avoid, uh, uh, avoid the cost. So there's an age-old adage, of, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So let's focus on lowering healthcare costs primarily with prevention. Um, obviously, we Americans were pretty unhealthy. Some of it is lifestyle, some of it is diet choices, but a lot of it is just age-related diseases. We are living longer, which means that uh, really dangerous and expensive diseases like heart disease and cancer are killing us instead of accidents and treatable infections. So therefore, the focus should be on healthy aging, such as with regenerative medicines that can get you back to full health, and then rejuvenation therapies that can uh, actively lower your age. And there's been a lot of breakthroughs uh, just in the last few weeks, where AI has helped us identify uh, chemicals, substances, enzymes, many of them naturally occurring in, in nature, that can actually literally de-age your cells. So basically, the, the cheapest doctor, the best doctor, is the one that you never need. And then if we can replace the rest with robots and AI and that kind of thing, then like you know the cost of healthcare just collapses. Because, you know, I remember I was... Uh, a couple of years ago before the pandemic, I was visiting a bar with a friend and the bartender, she was a little bit younger. She was in her 20s and she was like, why would I have health insurance? I am healthy. And I'm like, <laughs> just wait till your 30s or 40s. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, and th this was actually one of the biggest problems with Obamacare here in America was that young people didn't sign up because young people didn't care because young people are healthy, right? Most of our health costs are age related. So what I suspect in the future is that most healthcare is going to be, so take those self-driving cars and your robotic doctor, you call and just say, hey, I need a checkup or, hey, I'm feeling sick. And then, you know, like an automated uh, car pulls up and a robot doctor comes out and, you know, says, okay, what's wrong? You know, t does a couple of tests and then, you know, treats you on the spot and then away they go. So you even get rid of most hospitals. Now, that being said, you're still going to need trauma centers for like accidents and uh, there will probably still will be some major diseases, uh, things that require uh, ICUs and that sort of stuff. But if we can drastically reduce the need, even just the baseline need for edu uh, not education for healthcare, then that's a great way to avoid the cost. Because the thing is, is if you are healthy, that is cheap. So this is this is an expense that we can just hypothetically fully get rid of. So I call this healthcare avoidance. Um, you know. AI is going to be the primary thing here with personalized genetic medicine, stem cell therapy, de-aging, rejuvenation, that sort of stuff. One thing is that uh, a lot of people are like, oh, the elites are never going to allow the rest of us to have... Yeah, bullshit. Um, no. The thing is, is that healthy consumers are good consumers. Dead consumers don't spend any money, right? So yes, the insurance companies and you know the, the big pharma and stuff, they want to keep you sick. But the thing is, is that's not good for the economy because if you have to spend, you know, 8% or 16% or for people that with dealing with chronic conditions, up to half of their money on, on just health, it would be way better for the economy, the government, for society, for literally everyone else, except for the people who profiteer off of uh, uh, chronic illnesses. It would be better for literally everyone else to just get rid of those health issues altogether. 
Um, being healthy is cheap. Cheap citizens keep paying taxes. Uh, they keep working. Uh, cheap or healthy consumers keep buying goods and services, and they buy goods and services other than healthcare. So the economic incentive is there. So whenever people complain about like, oh, well, the elites are going to keep it for themselves, I don't think that's going to be the case. And one thing, that, another reason that I believe this is because when you look at what it actually takes to create regenerative medicine, uh, autologous stem cells and rejuvenation therapies, these are not particularly expensive. Yeah, I know there's that that tech bro out in California who's spending a million dollars a year to like, quote, get back to age 18. Um you know, but the thing is, is like a lot of these, uh, yes, that, that is expensive, but when you look at what's actually effective and the, the underlying principles, it's not that expensive. And all we need to do is like figure out how to mass produce some of these things and the economics, it makes sense. This is another thing where I think uh, government subsidies will make sense as well, because if you cure something permanently, if the treatment is not that expensive, hypothetically, but you still need someone to do it, I, I think that the pharmas and doctors and everyone else will probably be incentivized through subsidies. Like basically, here's how I might structure that incentive uh, structure, where let's say, let's say someone comes to you and they've got a chronic condition. What you would do is actually uh, incentivize the doctor to cure that chronic condition by saying, if you cure this permanently, you get a $20,000 bonus for curing it permanently. Um, so basically you incentivize the behavior that you want to see. If it's like heart disease, like, oh, hey, like you've got high cholesterol, you've, you're starting to get heart failure. Let's give you the right medicines, the right therapies, the right treatments to permanently cure this, to clear all your arteries, to make sure that your health, that your heart is as healthy as it was when you were eight years old, right? Then you incentivize that. You incentivize the cure, not the treatment, because that's one of the biggest problems with uh, medicine today is through government subsidies and Medicare and Medicaid and all that stuff, we incentivize the treatment, which is why doctors overdiagnose. But what we really need to do is incentivize the cures. Okay. Now, one thing that I need to address, and I have addressed this in previous videos, is that even if we create hyperabundance of energy and timber and, a, and cognitive labor, there's still going to be a few primary scarce inputs to the economy, namely desirable land and rare minerals. So, to address both of these, desirable land, uh, as I mentioned, America is super, super, super empty. Uh, there is a lot of place that we can spread to. And if your job is not tied, one, if you don't have a job, you can live anywhere you want. Um, but also, if your job is not tied to a geographic location, a particular city, you can also move wherever you want. Remote work is on the rise. So there is a lot of space that we can spread out into. And before you say, oh, well, there's a reason people don't live there, that's not necessarily true. Uh, a lot of the frontier towns were built by the railroad companies who just said, hey, we're going to build a railroad through this area. They bought all the land. They built it. They literally just fabricated a town, which is why you see some of them in straight lines, right, through like uh, Arkansas and Nebraska and stuff, is because they were literally just fabricated out of the Great Plains where the railroads created a train station and then sold the land uh, and developed it and said, look, now there's a town here. I think we're going to see the same thing again, not necessarily through railroads, but point. my point is that you can uh, create a town pretty much anywhere in America. Now, one the biggest problem is water is actually the scarcest resource. But with energy hyperabundance, you can recycle water pretty easily. So yeah, if you want to live out in New Mexico, you might live a little bit more like the Fremen, which some people would want to do that anyways. Rare minerals is going to be the other big thing, but I don't know if you saw in the news, NASA and a few others are working on sending probes uh, to like uh, asteroids and meteors uh, that are chock full of really, really valuable minerals. So hopefully we can end up with a hyperabundance of minerals just by mining asteroids in space. If we can't do that, the coming uh, age of quantum computing is going to help us create what's called metamaterials. So these are like nanoparticles that uh, give us properties that you wouldn't otherwise expect. So one of the most famous one, of course, is like uh, carbon nanotubes and um, and graphene, right? Graphene is uh, a single sheet of carbon which has really really cool properties. It can be uh, it can be um, uh, superconductive. It can uh, be a, a super super fast transistor. That sort of stuff. 
So metamaterials and material science will be accelerated by artificial intelligence and quantum computing. So hopefully we can just say, you know what, instead of you know needing cobalt and, and nickel and cadmium and lithium, what if we can just make everything out of iron and carbon with, with nanoparticles that are really cheap to mass produce? We're not there yet, but hypothetically it's possible. So we could overcome these two major scarce bottlenecks. So I mentioned quantum computing. I found this interesting quotation uh, from an article by the U.S. Department of Energy. Quantum computing enables unprecedented material science simulations. So basically, uh, as quantum computing ramps up, and I just posted a, an article, IBM, uh, their 127 qubit quantum computer is actually doing real work now. So quantum, the age of quantum computing is ramping up. That'll help us solve stuff like fusion and everything else to do with energy, make better solar panels, cheaper solar panels. Uh, genetics uh, and diseases, very complex interactions and discovering new drugs and, and that sort of stuff. Quantum computing can help with that. Artificial intelligence can already help with that. Uh, but you can get a much better, faster simulation. One of the most interesting things about quantum computing is because it basically magically solves optimization problems, we have a really hard time verifying the results. So basically you run the simulation and then you'll have to test it in reality to see if the simulation was accurate. But they're establishing benchmarks about how to gauge the accuracy of a quantum simulation. This material science will also accelerate our understanding of batteries, metals, and other metamaterials, as I mentioned. Solar. Solar is going to be one of the big things on top of everything else that helps with uh, uh, driving down the costs. Um, I've seen a lot of people mention Computronium um, in the comments, which, okay, yes, I know Isaac Arthur loves talking about things like Computronium and other stuff, uh, but... But this is already happening. Someone asked me, and I'm like, neuromorphic chips exist. Like, so a neuromorphic chip is basically an analog chip that in some cases just uses ambient energy to do computation. It's a real thing, but you can't just magically transmute matter into computational material. You have to create a metamaterial, which is very difficult uh, right now. And no, the entire light cone will not be transmuted into computronium. That is pure fantasy, I think. Um, now, that being said, yes, I do believe that the universe is itself a computer. So technically, all matter is already computronium. It's just not computing something that you deliberately want it to because of the laws of entropy and that sort of stuff. Anyways, getting lost in a tangent. Quantum computing is on the, is on the ascendancy. And so you have quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and energy hyperabundance all coming together that are going to continue to drive down the costs of literally everything. So this is the snowball effect. Uh, AI is already accelerating science and lots of other stuff, for that matter. Um, I, I think actually one of the future hackathons that I'm going to put on is let's automate science as much as possible. Uh, you, you have this compounding return where AI helps you do science faster. It helps you research AI faster. It helps you uh, create more energy abundance faster, which all feeds back into the system, accelerating the AI, which then accelerates material science. What, you know, so you get this virtuous cycle, this snowball effect, where uh, suddenly all problems seem to be solvable faster and faster. So this is the triple crown. Uh, artificial intelligence, Quantum computing, oh, and quantum computing, I think I, me, I forgot to mention this, is that quantum computing will also help us design better chips and the materials that go into those better chips. So then the quantum computers can help design better quantum computers and better GPUs and better TPUs, which then allows us for better AI, which can then improve quantum computing and fusion. And so you have this three-way interaction, this trifecta of these three technologies that are going to just completely spiral. And so... Those are the three technologies that will lead to hard takeoff. Um, these are the three technologies that will lead to the uh, singularity. Is it's not just artificial intelligence. It's artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and, um, and energy hyperabundance, a.k.a. solar wind fusion, that sort of stuff. The TLDR is that all material concerns basically go away. Uh, they become so cheap that the cost is trivial that I, I suspect you'll, they'll have to just subsidize those with government uh, subsidies. And so universal basic income is basically going to be paid for by virtue of we're going to destroy the cost of living. So butterfly effect, as I've talked about, there's all these kinds of interactions and compounding returns and virtuous cycles 
This is why I give all my code away for free. So I mentioned this at the beginning of the video with my Patreon. I refuse to sign any NDAs because any problem that I solve that has the ability to accelerate this future cannot be locked up as intellectual property. And honestly, with the way that AI is going, I think intellectual property is probably also going the way of the dinosaurs. Because if AI is generating all intellectual property, who cares? Um, the economic productivity that we're going to see in the next couple of years, yes, it's going to be impressive. Yes, we're going to have quadrillion dollar companies. But that all absolutely pales in comparison to what's coming decades after that. Like when we have the possibility of curing literally every disease imaginable and live long enough to see the stars, to see the future, what does money matter? Like what does the economics matter? So basically solve, solve all these other problems and money becomes irrelevant. So this is the underpinning reason for all of my work and the axiomatic alignment, the heuristic imperatives that I've been working on, which is why I want to equip AI with these things, because you reduce suffering by treating diseases. You reduce suffering by uh, increasing justice, by protecting individual liberty and human rights. You increase prosperity by accelerating science, by deploying infrastructure, by protecting ecosystems. You increase understanding by communication, by education, by teaching, by reinforcing that, that virtuous cycle of science and, com and computation and artificial intelligence. All of these things work together in compounding returns in order to create the future that we want to see, aka utopia, which I know utopia is a, is a loaded term, but to me utopia means high standard of living, high individual uh, liberty, and high social mobility. That's the goal. All right. Thanks for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this. Cheers.